Hello and welcome everyone. This is lecture 42 of the series on fluids and electrolytes. This series of lectures explain and expand on the concepts in my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. It's available on Amazon. You can find the link at the description below. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. We are still on chapter 6, hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia, and we continue here in this lecture our discussion of hypocalcemia. Let's continue our discussion of the etiology of hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia is less common than hypercalcemia. When we are faced with hypocalcemia, we are going to check PTH. The normal response to low calcium is elevation in PTH. But if you have PTH deficiency, PTH is going to be either normal or low normal. So when we have low calcium, we're going to check PTH. If PTH is deficient, it's going to be low or low normal. And in that case, phosphorus will be high because PTH is phosphaturic. So when it is low, phosphorus is not going to be excreted efficiently. Now, PTH is high in all other causes, meaning anything other than PTH deficiency is going to cause high PTH. Okay. Vitamin D deficiency, acute pancreatitis, hungry bone syndrome, and magnesium deficiency cause hypocalcemia with normal or low serum phosphate. Okay. Because, for example, with vitamin D deficiency, uh, you are going to have decreased absorption of both calcium and phosphorus in the intestine. With acute pancreatitis, hungry bone syndrome, phosphorus and calcium are going to precipitate, whether in the pancreas or in the bone. Now, when do we see hungry bone syndrome? It is seen post-parathyroidectomy in patients with severe hyperparathyroidism. And this is an important diagnosis. Uh, you have to give a lot of calcium, oral and uh, intravenous. You may have to give magnesium, and you sometimes you have to give even phosphate. Primary hypoparathyroidism is not nearly as common as primary hyperparathyroidism, but it is seen occasionally. It can be due to antibodies against the parathyroid glands or activating, okay, activating antibodies against the calcium sensing receptor. In either case, you're going to see hypocalcemia. More commonly, though, you can see transient or even permanent hypoparathyroidism after a thyroidectomy. Now, if you have activating mutations, genetic mutations, of the calcium sensing receptor, you are going to have then hereditary hypoparathyroidism. And in that case, you are going to have marked, marked hypercalciuria. Many patients with advanced chronic kidney disease have secondary hyperparathyroidism. Okay, I said hyper, not hypo. Hyperparathyroidism, meaning high PTH. And unlike primary hyperparathyroidism, they have low or low normal calcium due to calcitriol deficiency. So in patients with CKD, although they have secondary hyperparathyroidism with high PTH, their calcium is either low or low normal. Why? Because they have calcitriol deficiency. And this is a way to differentiate primary from secondary hyperparathyroidism. In primary, calcium is usually high. In secondary, it's low or low normal. In both cases, PTH uh, will be elevated. Um, obviously, in secondary hyperparathyroidism, you need something to cause it. And in that case, it's advanced CKD. High doses of vitamin D will cause hypercalcemia in patients with advanced CKD. So, if we have a patient with chronic kidney disease, calcium can be low or normal or high, depending on the circumstances. Many patients with advanced CKD, stage 4, 5, or patients on dialysis, serum phosphate is high, even though we have vitamin D deficiency. Why? Because the kidneys cannot excrete phosphate. Now, we use sinacalcid and italcalcitide for treatment of secondary hyperparathyroidism in dialysis patients. But these medications, which are called calcimimetics, they are positive all allosteric calcium cysting receptor modulator, they cause hypocalcemia. So they control PTH, they lower PTH and lower calcium. So we are always very careful about hypocalcemia. We check calcium 
at a certain level if he start to get calcium below 8.5 especially below 8 um, we supplement calcium if if it continues to be low it's time to uh, consider discontinu discontinuation of the calcium emetic medication or lowering the dose One study found hypocalcemia in 55% of patients admitted to a critical care unit of a tertiary care center. So we have an entity called critical illness hypocalcemia. It is multifactorial. You have vitamin D deficiency in those patients, abnormal PTH secretion, abnormal PTH action, circulating catecholamines, medications, adverse effects, and citrate in blood transfusions. So all these things contribute to hypocalcemia in critical illness. Okay, now you have really to pay attention to albumin here. You have to correct calcium for albumin or check ionized calcium because these patients also have hypoalbuminemia. How does hypocalcemia manifest? Many patients with chronic and mild hypocalcemia are asymptomatic. So the clinical manifestations depend on two things, the severity of hypocalcemia and the rapidity of its onset. So hypocalcemia can cause muscle weakness, fatigue, confusion, depression, memory loss. Well, you've heard that before with many other electrolytes. These things are not really specific. Now, if you have severe manifestations of hypocalcemia, you could have seizures. You could have tetany. Now, this is common and well-known. Parathesia laryngospasm, anxiety, and QT interval prolongation. So with low calcium, we're going to have QT interval prolongation. With high calcium, we are going to have QT interval shortening. Okay, everyone has studied this in med school, Trousseau sign and Schwostick sign. Let's remind ourselves with these signs. Trousseau sign is carpopedal spasm. So this carpopedal spasm happens when you, we are measuring blood pressure. So we put the cuff on the upper arm and we keep the cuff inflated over systolic blood pressure for three minutes and uh, this will result in forearm ischemia and if you have hypocalcemia you are going to have carpopedal spasm. What about Schwostick sign? Schwostick sign is facial muscle twitching. So if we tap the facial nerve near the jaw angle about two centimeters anterior to the earlobe we are going to have facial muscle twitching. And both of these signs indicate neuromuscular excitability due to hypocalcemia. Now, chronic hypocalcemia, now this is chronic, not acute. Chronic hypocalcemia, as in patients with hypoparathyroidism, can cause dry keratotic skin, ridged nails, coarse brittle hair. So it can have a lot of dermatological manifestations. How do we evaluate for hypocalcemia? Well, it's, first, the diagnosis is easy on uh, any basic metabolic panel. You have calcium. You can verify that with ionized calcium, like we said. You are going to look at albumin. So you can correct uh, for hypo or hyperalbuminemia. Better yet, get ionized calcium. You need to get magnesium and phosphate, like we said. If you have severe hypocalcemia, get an EKG and monitor the patient on telemetry during replacement. Um, now, to determine the etiology, you are going to check kidney function, okay, uh, because CKD, like we said, is associated with secondary hyperparathyroidism. PTH is critically important because this way you can differentiate PTH lowering causes like hypoparathyroidism from other causes that would raise PTH. You are going to check 25-hydroxy vitamin D because it's a common cause of hypocalcemia. 125-dihydroxy D is not commonly checked. Uh, patients with chronic kidney disease have low level anyway, and it's an expensive test, takes a while to come back. And with hypocalcemia in particular, we don't check it. Uh, we may check it in hypercalcemia. We'll talk about that later. 24-hour urine calcium and phosphate are occasionally checked. Uh, patients with elevated PTH and elevated creatinine due to chronic kidney disease can have hypocalcemia due to secondary hyperparathyroidism. I, I said this now for the third time because it's very important. As nephrologists, we see this every day. Now, again, low PTH points towards hypoparathyroidism. If PTH is elevated, like you would expect with hypocalcemia, then uh, if we have low 25-hydroxy D, then the patient has vitamin D deficiency. You replace D and you're done. You can uh, go with D2 ergocalciferol or D3 cholecalciferol. Now, 
Some patients have rare, rare conditions, vitamin D-dependent rickets, vitamin D-resistant rickets, and those patients have elevated PTH and normal 25-hydroxy-D. So these cases are only for the pediatric nephrologist, the pedi pediatric rheumatologist. If you're an adult nephrologist, uh, you'd be lucky to see like one case every 10, 20 years. I think in all of my career, I've seen one case. How do we manage hypocalcemia? If the patient is symptomatic, usually calcium is less than 7.6 milligram per deciliter or 1.9 millimole uh, per liter. Um, in that case, ionized calcium will be less than one. We give intravenous calcium. The preferred uh, intravenous calcium salt is calcium gluconate, okay? One gram contains 93 milligram of elemental calcium or 2.32 millimoles. You can use calcium chloride. It has about three times more elemental calcium than calcium gluconate, but you need a central one. Um, if we have uh, severe hypocalcemia, if we are replacing a lot of calcium, especially if the patient is on digoxin, it's better to have the patient on telemetry. If the patient is asymptomatic and the hypocalcemia is mild, you can treat with oral calcium salts, calcium carbonate or calcium citrate. The preferred salt is calcium carbonate because one gram contains 400 milligrams of elemental calcium, so 40% of its weight. Calcium citrate may be better tolerated, uh, but has lower calcium. About 21% uh, of its weight is elemental calcium. Calcium acetate, it's not used as a replacement. We use it as nephrologists as a phosphate binder in patients with CKD. Vitamin D should be replaced if deficient. Like we said, uh, we can use ergocalciferol, vitamin D2, or D3, which is cholecalciferol. Either way, you're fine. And uh, you can use uh, weekly doses of ergocalciferol. You can use daily doses of cholecalciferol. Um, all these combinations are fine. In some patients, especially if you have uh, hypoparathyroidism, you need oral calcitriol, and the dose is 0 0.25 to 1 microgram per day. Uh, hypomagnesemia should be treated for sure. Hyperphosphatemia with hypoparathyroidism, we treat that with phosphate binders, preferably calcium acetate, so this way you are giving calcium and binding phosphorus and low phosphate diet. Uh, a word of caution here. In patients with hypoparathyroidism, calcium should be kept in the lower normal range because if you give too much vitamin D, too much calcium, you are going to end up with kidney stones. So you'll have hypercalciuria, nephrolithiasis, nephrocalcinosis, calcifications. And really, these patients should be seen by, uh, by an endocrinologist. So uh, uh, th this is not that common, and uh, you need a specialist help. Now, uh, finally, recombinant human parathyroid hormone, RHPTH1284, 84 meaning like the number of uh, amino acids, or NATPARA, is approved in the U.S. for the management of hypocalcemia in patients with hypoparathyroidism, in addition, of course, to calcium and vitamin D. However, this medicine, again, is restricted in distribution, should be used by an experienced endocrinologist. It has a black box warning because there is a potential for osteosarcoma. Thiazide diuretics would help in hypercalciuria. They lower they lower urinary calcium excretion. So patients, especially with kidney stones due to hypercalciuria, are potential candidates for thiazide diuretics. We use that all the time, hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothalidone. Of course, you want to make sure that they don't get hypokalemic, they don't get dehydrated, etc. But we use thiazides all the time for the treatment of hypercalciuria. I'm going to end here, and we'll continue our discussion on calcium in the next lecture. See you then.